I'm uh, Louise Sundin, and I uh, have a lot of former hats that I wear. I was uh, once a union goon with the uh, American Federation of Teachers for 25 years and the uh, Minneapolis Federation of Teachers president for 22. Um, those were simultaneous, not uh, sequential. <laughs> I also taught 30 years of ninth grade English in the Minneapolis schools, and um, I'm really proud that uh, you are all here tonight. Uh, particularly, I want to thank uh, my colleagues on the Minsku board and um, uh, the, the chancellor. Uh, the, my colleagues on the board and I uh, never get tired patting ourselves on the back for having, uh, being so brilliant as to hire uh, Chancellor Rosenstone except until yesterday when now we can't, we're, we will never tire uh, ourselves from hiring our latest president. So we're um, glad that you're here to celebrate with her and with us. So we um, are celebrating tonight a woman that uh, I had the pleasure of knowing and uh, some of you in the room had the pleasure of knowing also. But I was interested to read not too long ago that uh, when Klim, Kim Hines, the playwright, uh, interviewed Nellie, uh, which a number of years before this play was uh, presented, actually uh, before David interviewed her, um, she, she expressed concern and worry. And those of us who knew her never thought she worried. But uh, she worried about the fact that she didn't think that there was going to be anybody who was going to remember her. There wasn't going to be any way that her story would be told. There wasn't any way that she could see at that time that the children in Minnesota would read her story, know what her story had been, know what the challenges had been that she had struggled through, her family had struggled through, know what the, the birth of the, the labor movement of the hotel restaurant workers in Minnesota was. And so she expressed a grave concern about that. So um, Nellie, there's a trifecta of recognition that's happening right now. And the first one is, uh, well, maybe not the first. I'll get to the first. One of them is in the legis moving through the legislature right now, um, Frank and I um, went over to uh, testify Monday night. There is a bill that Lyndon, I'm sure, is going to make sure gets passed <laughs> that is uh, to place a bust of Nellie in the capital of the state of Minnesota. Now that's all because of our friend Joe Mullery, who is representative of North Minneapolis. Stand up, Joe. Now Joe didn't exactly know the rules the first time he tried to do this. She was still alive the first time he tried to do it. They said, well, sorry, Joe, you know, it's a little early. So now, He's uh, going through the process again, and we really appreciate, Joe, your uh, taking this on. Thank you. The second thing that Mitch already mentioned was the play. And for some, uh, like Mitch, I saw it three times, and you saw it a couple of times in, in previous dinners. And that play show, uh, showed a portion of Nellie's life, the 30s and the 40s. But that was only a portion. And they stayed away with, uh, from all the political stuff, of course. You'll hear some of that tonight. So I have the great pleasure tonight to uh, interview, uh, introduce David Brower, who has been a freelance writer and a Minnesota correspondent for Newsweek, the Chicago Tribune, uh, a contributing editor for Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, an award-winning journalist. He is an alternative weekly writer. Uh, a community newspaper editor, a radio talk show host, and now a media and political reporter for MinPost, which we all view daily, right? Um, in his spare time, he writes books. So uh, he's the one who wrote this book, and this is our third remembrance of Nellie in the trifecta. 
the most time he's spent with any single subject in his 30-year career was with Nellie Stone Johnson. In dozens of interviews over two years, David compiled Nellie's oral history, The Life of an Activist, which was published back in 2000 by Ruminator Books. And we, of course, if you haven't bought it already, it's in the hallway. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Tamara. <laughs> Just the other day, his 12-year-old daughter's teacher did a web search for Nelly, and lo and behold, his daughter's dad's name came up. Way cool. Um, City Page's review of this book when it came out said this, and I like this the be a lot. Next time you feel in a whiny mood, politics is corrupt, labor movement is dead, the schools suck, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, and you don't feel so hot either, and there's been too much cold and snow, skip the Prozac and go instead for a dose of Nellie Stone Johnson. 95 years old and getting sharper every day, Nellie doesn't so much restore your faith in humanity as she demands it. This African-American, Ojibwe, German, French, hotel worker, seamstress, labor matriarch, this farm kid from P uh, Pine County who taught Hubert Humphrey about civil rights, this hellraiser since the Roosevelt administration can tell you a couple of things about what makes a difference. You may not have had a chance to see her live, so grab a copy of her autobiography and then quit whining and do something. <laughs> so David, come on up. We are very grateful to you for extending the life of our friend and family member into the future. Without this record, the lessons of that life, that leader, that role model to so many of us in this room would be lost to future generations. David Brower, tell us about the Nellie that you got to know and the life you recorded for all of us for history. A wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being at the scholarship fund. Um, I know this was this is a cherished thing in Nellie's life. Um, I just want to say that I realized as I was preparing for this speech that in two weeks it'll be ten years since she was gone, uh, April second, two thousand two, which is seems like just yesterday to a lot of us, I know. And it was 13 years ago that I was interviewing her first at the uh, New French Bar, which doesn't even exist anymore, uh, and later on at her uh, senior high-rise Minneapolis Public Housing just across from the Minneapolis Public Library. Uh, I was asked to speak about her later life, later than Kim's fine play, and, uh, and about her political life. Uh, so I'm going to start when she was 39. Uh, and I'm going to place her at the YMCA in downtown Minneapolis. She's one of 20 people, and she is in this cafeteria on a Sunday trying to hammer out a merger between the Farmer Labor Party and the Democrats. How did she get to be one of the 20 people at that table? Well, Shar talked about some of the history of what she did at the start of her union career. Um, as she built up her bona fides, she eventually was elected uh, a vice president of her union, the hotel and restaurant workers. And I don't know if it's still this way at unions now, but back then there were a lot of vice presidents. And Nellie joked with me that she was elected the 32nd vice president of the hotel and restaurant workers union. And being a 32nd vice president was something of a token job. And so she said that her first big duty was organizing the Christmas party, which may have seemed like a put down given, you know, what had to be done in the labor movement in the 30s. But she told me, I realized it was a powerful position for getting whole families involved. What I'm known for in Minnesota is that all you have to do is make Nellie Stone Johnson the 32nd vice president, and I'll gather all the power I need. <laughs> and she did. That's why she was at the table. She worked her way into having substantial accomplishments 
for her union, one of the ones that I remembered was talking about trying to get health insurance for her unions. They had the money. They had been able to get money at the hotel and restaurant workers union to get health insurance. They had to buy it independently. They went to three insurance companies, including the only insurance company in Minneapolis that would sell policies to black people. They all turned her down, every single one. They were all doing business with the Chamber of Commerce. They did not want to do business with the union. So what did she and her union brothers and sisters do? They got in a train and they went to Winnipeg, Canada, and they cut a deal with the Great Western Insurance Company of Canada for the first health insurance policy of that year. Can you imagine someone turning down 17,000 customers today, Nellie told me in 1999. I guess I can still imagine people who don't want people to get health care. That's all too easy to imagine. So that's how she got named as a union rep on the merger committee, actions like that. Uh, from her perspective, the impetus was to get FDR elected to his fourth term in 1944. Uh, she also mentioned preserving Social Security, which at that time was less than 10 years old. It was a, still a tenuous accomplishment. And today, they're still fighting to preserve Social Security, even 60 years later. But she also said that the, uh, the Democrats, obviously the National Party, needed help. They needed help registering minority voters, for one thing. The way she described it, the Southern Democrats, they were racist. The Democrats here, well, they were often the same type of people as the Republicans, only with a little more humanity, which is why the Farmer Labor Party stuck around so long. She argued for the merger, telling the Farmer Labor members of the coalition that they were in the stronger position. They had more people power, but that align with the Democrats would ha get them more influence on the national stage. Four years after this merger, Hubert Humphrey got up in Philadelphia at the Democratic National Convention and talked about the bright sunshine of human rights. He proved Nellie right. It was in uh, Humphrey's direct interest that this merger happened. He'd been defeated for mayor of Minneapolis in 1943. I'm not sure how many people remember that. And so he was pushing for the merger big time. On June 12, 1945, he, uh, he won election 61% to 39% becoming the mayor of Minneapolis at the tender age of 34. The secondary headline in one of the newspapers that day, city elects first Negro to library board position. That was Nellie. She'd been urged to run by Humphrey on his 1945 slate. She had her eye on the school board, but unfortunately for her, she had been instrumental in organizing a union slate of three candidates, uh, the wife of a construction worker, another union person, and a young business person to try to get the broadest coalition. I figured the library board was not too far removed from the school board, she said. Whatever you could do from there, you could do from the library position. Humphrey had campaigned with her and the unions campaigned for her, and that helped. But when you looked at the election returns, a lot of the areas in white Minneapolis didn't vote for her. She did win by 20,000 votes. So how did that happen? Well, some precincts in northeast Minneapolis, which, were, which was pretty white at the time, uh, voted for her 10 to 1. 10 to 1. How did that happen? She credited union households and door knocking, her own door knocking during the day when she knocked the doors and women answered. And she talked to women, not about women's specific concerns, but about the pay that their husbands were making, about equal pay, about justice, and about how they could feed their families. And that's how she won votes. The people she talked to voted for her. She actually thought about running for Congress. I didn't know this until I did the book. Uh, but there were some pretty daunting obstacles. Back then, the Minneapolis district was much bigger than uh, it is today, and it reached all the way up into the more conservative north central part of the, uh, of the state. She said, north of Forest Lake, I'd have to convince people I was close to an angel, right next to God, if they were going to vote for a black person. <laughs> 
So instead, she delivered 97% of the North Minneapolis vote to another candidate. She told me, for the people who tell me about the demise of politics, I will tell them to drop dead. Get all the people out there to vote. That's what I did, election after election. She worked on the National Armed Services Committee Against Racism before that decade was out. She was also the leader of the black labor faction of the NAACP. Uh, this was before Brown versus the board. She knew Thurgood Marshall. She told me a story about them passing each other on the escalator, sort of talking to each other in the middle, and then both deciding to get off and continue the conversation. She said that there was a debate within the NAACP about whether the legal response should be to more adequately fund separate but equal or target separate but equal. You can guess which side Nellie was on. She was on the side of blowing it up. Thurgood Marshall took the case and they won. The 50s were a tough decade for Nellie. She'd lose her job, she'd lose her library board seat, and she'd lose her union office. In 1950, she'd been at the athletic club for three decades. She was a receptionist at the time. They wouldn't let her off for library board service. They wouldn't let an elected official go serve the public from her position. Eventually, they fired her, and this was the reason that she gave me. I was using the phone, the athletic club phone, for an organizing drive. They said I couldn't do that, but how else was I supposed to be organizing? They used their phone to organize for the Chamber of Commerce. I was just using their model against them. <laughs> she landed at Wilson Alteration Shirt Shop on First Avenue North. This was the beginning of uh, what would be the, her, her vocational career for the rest of her life. Uh, how did she get hired? I think their eye was too set on, on, produ on productivity to discriminate. At night, she had a second job making snowsuits for a company called Zero King. Everybody who knows Nellie knows how hard she worked. Nobody worked harder. And this is just one example. Later on in that decade, the Red Scare would cost Nellie twice. At the U, back in the 20s and 30s, she was a part of the Young Communist League. Why? because they were one of the few groups at that time who were for education for all. A lot of the establishment organizations weren't going anywhere near it. A lot of the liberals weren't going anywhere near it. That left it to the communists. At one point, when she was a vice president of her union, she was told there's an FBI spy on our board. Nellie's response, I say so what? What would we do differently? But in the late 40s, that kind of history in the wake of the Soviet split of Europe, that was bad history. That red baiting was on the rise. Nellie saw it as a splitting maneuver, that the Jews were the communists and the blacks should stay away. She saw this as fracturing a coalition that had taken blood, sweat, and tears to build. At organizing meetings, she started to hear, that's a communist idea. I said, why should the communists get credit for all the good ideas? <laughs> why should communists get the benefit of promoting equal opportunity for all people? But in 1951, after she lost her union election two to one, the local paper wrote, the defeat of Ms. Stone marks the final step in ridding the union of left-wing officers who at one time exercised virtual control of the union. In that kind of a climate, Nellie decided not to run for the library board again. But she found herself called before the local grand jury to answer for her alleged political crimes. When she got there, she found out that the prosecutor was the son of a woman on a block where Nellie went door to door raising a dollar a month for Democrats. Nellie had door knocked this guy's mom, back in the Great Depression. She thought that relationship made him go easy on her in the questioning, and it never went anywhere, 
after her testimony before the grand jury in which she refused to name names. She then went out and raised money for union organizers who were jailed on the pretext of being communists. That's Nellie. One of, the, one of the interesting things about her is that her reputation was so solid, even though she'd gone through these bad years, that as the Red Scare faded, she just kept at it, working for justice, and eventually was welcomed back into the halls of, uh, of power and organizing. One of her signature accomplishments came in the mid-50s, in the wake of all of this. In 1955, uh, Minnesota had a Fair Housing Act, but it took five years after that, I'm sorry, five, Fair Employment Act, it took five years after that for Minnesota to pair, pass a fair housing law, say that you can't discriminate on the basis of race. It took us until 1960. Hubert Humphrey had given his speech in 1948. Think about that. One of the people that she praised when I talked to her about how that campaign became successful was a senator by the name of Al Qui, a Republican. Nellie was a partisan, but she was also a coalition builder. And, she, and Qui was somebody that she honored 40, even 40 years later when we talked. He was a farmer, she said, and very human. That was her highest compliment, human, humanity. Qui told her, over the weekend I did some plowing. He was a farmer in southern Minnesota. And I decided to vote for your legislation. She praised him as a very religious man who acted on the religious precepts of caring for the poor. In 1963, at 58, she decided to go to work for herself, opening Nellie's alterations. She did it on the savings that she acquired working for the Wilsons. She borrowed from Third Northwestern Bank, which was uh, by the Central Avenue Labor Temple in Northeast Minneapolis. She kept her insurance only by being a union officer. The union extended insurance to all of the executive officers. Nellie made sure she was an officer. Um, she did piece work for every department store at the time. Donaldson's, Rothschild's, Jester's, Eklund, they all sent work out to Nellie. Not Dayton's originally. Why? Nellie said Dayton's work people half to death. <laughs> but she was a savvy businesswoman, she really was. When she, she saved enough money that she was able to buy specialized machines with the loan proceeds that she got from Third Northwestern. Eventually, Dayton's had to come to her to get the specialty garments sewn on time for her clients. And she got them to work with her on her terms. She had two employees, she paid union wages, eight hour days, and vacation time. In the 1970s, she teamed up with Rudy Perpich. That was a big meeting in 1972 when they first got to know each other. A lot of why you're here today is because of that pairing. Here's how Nellie distilled it. And Stephen Rosenstone hit at some of it. People like Rudy Perpich firmly believed in people working. I don't know if anyone believed in it more firmly than Rudy Perpich except me. To him, that was the cure for almost everything. In 1976, Perpich helped her get an appointment on the Democratic National Committee. She'd been a runner-up for the seat when there had been an, a, an election, but Perpich found a way to name an incumbent DNC member to a uh, state board. So Nellie got to win the, uh, the now open seat. She served for nine years until 1988 when she was 83. What did she want out of Rudy Perpich? Well, there are a lot of things, including this. One of, her, one of the things that she mentioned to me was LEAP, the Labor Education Advancement Program, job training. Rudy gave me money for any liberal thing I wanted, she said. <laughs> and she wanted it for apprentice training. Jim Rice knocked heads at the legislature for it. Around this time, Nellie, remember, 83, became the campaign manager for the 
man who became the first black elected to the Minneapolis City Council, Van White. As you think about the efforts to put a bust of Nellie Stone Johnson at the state capitol, understand that there is a bust of Van White at Minneapolis City Hall. It took until the 1980s, almost 40 years after Nellie became the first black elected in Minneapolis for there to be a black city council member. Once that door was busted open, we had a black mayor, yeah. not too long after. Yeah. Nellie, to get Van elected, had to beat the Rice political machine, and that is a tough political machine, the guy she'd been working with just a, just a little bit earlier. And also uh, Council President Lou DeMars, who supported a rival candidate. How did she do it? We outworked them, she said. We counted numbers. We knocked on more doors. She turned down Van White's offer to be his chief aide. Uh, and in 1980, another one of her patrons, Walter Mondale, managed to invite her on a goodwill trip to Africa. She went to Senegal, Niger, Nigeria. In Senegal, she stood where the slaves left for America in chains. In 1987, Rudy Perpich put her on the State College Board, which is now the Minsky Board. One of the things I am proudest of is my scholarship within Minsky, she said, the Nellie Stone Johnson Scholarship, which is why you're here tonight. She said she'd been beating the system up about this, and finally Robert Carruthers, the president of Southwest State, took up the call. He later wrote wonderful poems about Nellie if you, that are in, excerpts are in the book, but if you just have a chance, I guess now we can Google them probably. Go read them, they're fantastic. I don't know if there are any uh, presidents in the uh, Minsky system that can do poetry as well as, uh, as Robert Carruthers, but it is fantastic work. On May 26, 1995, Nellie was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters in humanities by St. Cloud State. I want to close with just a few words from, from her commencement address. The greatest tool you've been given is vision. You have always had a vision. A vision through education is honed, focused. But this vision means nothing unless it is pursued, followed, and turned into action. Use this vision. Enhance this vision. Use your education for good and the common good. Thank you.